If you are able, please stand to hear the word of God. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Hear the word of God. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. All right, again, good morning. I'm Chris Bryant, the senior pastor, and uh, what uh, a time we are finding ourselves in, a potentially a directionless time. Uh, uh, since March, this pandemic uh, has, for most of us, broken up a lot of sense of normalcy, as we've talked about already and even prayed about. We appreciate Jamie leading us in our morning prayer this morning, and how things continue to change and in many ways stay unpredictable. It has been, ironically, given that it's 2020, a year where we could not have possibly seen uh, the difficulty that lie, lied ahead. I've seen some unusual memes this year uh, for uh, describing such feelings. Uh, here's one that I found. Uh, this is Matthew McConaughey. So this is January 1st, then June 9th, you know. So cool Matthew is in that first picture, right? I'm pretty sure that is not Matthew McConaughey, uh, picture to the right, but nonetheless, we go from uh, chic to disheveled. Maybe you're feeling that way this morning. Then for you fans of uh, The Princess Bride, you know, the question is, where are we? You know, waking up every morning in 2020 is like, where are we? And of course, we're in the pit of despair, <clears throat> the pit of despair. And if you've seen that movie, you recognize what I just did there. Um, I like this one. This is, uh, this is my plans for 2020, right? Here's about my vision. I've got to, right, I'm going to make this great pot of chili and, oh, yeah, this is, it ends up all over me, right? How's, that, how's it working out? All those goals and objectives and the plans that you wanted. And then finally, I saw this one. This one is the one I really wanted to, to address today. Here's uh, 2020 going into the trash can. We'll just go ahead and just throw it away. What a year of garbage. Uh, just start all the way over. And actually, I felt really led to, to address that this morning in this final uh, sermon in this series of Finding Direction. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to do exactly the opposite, the opposite of throwing away the rest of this year. We have about five months left, a little over five months, and I find myself uh, in my own life, and then correspondingly wanting to share with you and uh, that um, that's the same thing that I feel led to share every January. Uh, every January, I, I try to give this advice and take it myself, uh, offering about somewhere around the second or third week of the new year, what I say is don't throw the year away. We, uh, at that point in time in, in a new year, uh, have had hopes and dreams and and uh, the thought is that well, things are just going to be different this next year. And uh, by that point in time, we've already recognized that uh, most things are still the same. It's not any kind of magic. Um, you know, it's going to be tough if we're going to change it all. And most folks just kind of shrug their shoulders and we end up just doing the same old things. Don't throw away another year. And, and the longer we live, I feel like the mo we can witness to this more and more. I certainly have tried to receive this advice from older people in my life, even folks here in this congregation, right? The, the, the time moves quicker the older you get. And, and so we don't have months to just throw away. We don't have years to throw away. Every day needs to be treated uh, as the precious gift of the present that it is, if you'll pardon that pun. Uh, I, I also read this week a wonderful, uh, well, I thought it was wonderful. It, it was a, a note that I'd taken while I was at some seminar at some point, and and, and the, the phrase was, you know, suffering can break you, or it can break you open. 
You know, what's it going to do? Is it going to break you or is it going to break you open? And I, I thought that's kind of what I've meant when I've said here in the last few months, let's not miss a good crisis. I mean, we're already in it anyway. So why not we look for what good can come from it? Remembering that transformation, real change, rarely happens, if ever, without pain, struggle, and difficulty. That seems like a good, sobering word this morning, doesn't it? Real change, transformation, rarely happens without pain, struggle, and difficulty. And we do better as we embrace this part of life. The more we try to run it, run from it, avoid it, that's when we run into problems. We, run, we develop obsessive compulsive behaviors, addictions. Uh, we tend to ruin relationships because we're seeking something that isn't real. We have to instead honor life for what it is. Messy, often frustrating, difficult, and make each day count. Not just going through the motions of normal routines, hoping for an idealized, unrealistic picture of life at some point in time. But again, as I've tried to receive wisdom from others who are older than me, even again, people in this congregation that have told me stories and tried to share pieces of wisdom with me, each of which I appreciate and take dear to heart, I think a lot of it comes down to simply recognizing if we're going to find direction in a time when we seem so directionless, simply acknowledging that life is what it is, that, that, that this, is, this is where real life is found, not in avoiding this But it's just in the normal every day and sometimes abnormal yet still every day kind of stuff. That's where life is found. Now the good news is Christian spirituality can help us. Because despite what a lot of people say and how they practice the faith, it is not an escapism religion. It's not about let everything else you know, go away, I'm going to one day go to heaven and I don't care about everything. No, the real Christian theology is that heaven comes to earth. Heaven comes into our own hearts. God sends Jesus. Jesus sends the disciples. The Holy Spirit sends us all. Our faith and spirituality embraces life and invades it and overcomes it. Jesus promises life in that much abundantly. Life before death as well as after death. Life in the midst of pain as well as when things are good. Life that makes things different even when the circumstances don't change. Real and certain life. This is what we're promised in Jesus Christ. And so how wise it is that we remember the scripture teaches to, uh, to teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Today's my 16,053rd day of life. Some of you remember that I do this literally, but it's been a helpful key for me, a helpful way to remember life happens every day. Make every day count. Part of how I find direction is by focusing in the moment. I want to talk to you today about uh, uh, our spirituality giving us our own kind of personal GPS. You remember GPS, right? It's the global positioning system or satellite system. But, but and, and, you know, there was a time when to get to have GPS, it was a luxury. You had to buy it uh, for your car. You had to have it installed. It was an amenity. It was a luxury. Uh, But nowadays, if you got a cell phone, you have a GPS system which is kind of amazing because I struggled. I said, no, when, when was it actually the last time I asked for directions? And, and before you say something smart or negative, I did ask for directions. In fact, I think the last time was when I moved to Georgia. It was uh, 1999, and I was visiting Atlanta in preparation for moving to Georgia and was uh, in Emory and had driven around there, but then was downtown. Oh, boy, I got turned around and got so sick and tired of saying peach, seeing the word peach in the name of every street we were on. thought, I have no idea where we are. got all messed around, right? We had to stop and ask for directions. But, but since then, it's interesting because now it doesn't matter where we go, down the road or across the nation, put the address in the phone and you get, bam, just immediately step-by-step instructions on how to get there. Wow. What if we had something like that for life? What if our spirituality could be some sort of step-by-step directional mapping system? Now, it's not going to work like that, not, not directly, not literally, but, but maybe indirectly. Could our spirituality give us some direction, a sense of purpose, even when we're living in directionless times? You know, before, when I would travel, maybe some of you relate to this as well, uh, traveling was a, a, a great anxiety-producing activity in my life, uh, especially if I was headed somewhere I'd never been before. 
I had a great deal of, of fear of the unknown, of fear of, of uh, you know, how do we actually get there? Are these the right directions? And, you know, did we miss our turn? This sort of thing. Uh, and, and you combine that with fatigue of, is this taking too long? Have we gone too far? What are we, you know, just frustration, fear, fatigue. It, traveling wasn't always a, a pleasant experience. And yet now, there with, you know, just putting an address into a phone, there's a, this sense of peacefulness that comes that I know where I am, even if I don't know where I am. Right? Because I could just zoom out on the old map. So I don't know. I have no clue where I am. I don't, I don't recognize anything. But if, it, but I'm, if I'm running the GPS, see, I can say, oh, I see. Okay. I can know where I am even if I don't know where I am. There's a peace that comes from that. There's a confidence that even though, boy, this is taking a lot longer than I thought. Well, that's all right. I'm just, there's still directions here. Eventually, I'm going to get to where I'm going. And I think our spirituality, our faith walk offers something similar for life in general. A peacefulness that comes with realizing where we are, even if we don't know where we are. And a confidence that even though this has taken a long time, maybe a lot longer than I expected, nonetheless, I'm going to get where I need to go. Our scripture again, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you will live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. And all the while you will grow as you learn to, go to, as you learn to know God better and better. A life, a personal life, GPS. Grow, pray, and study. Grow, pray, and stay. Let's take these one at a time. You know, there's there's many passages in the scripture that commend us to continue to grow. I like the one from First Peter, where where we are commended like newborn babies to crave spiritual milk so that we'll grow into a full experience of salvation. I like that. Or in Second Peter three eighteen, this is where a lot of benedictions come from, right? But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow, grow, go from here and grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior Christ. You know, a commitment to Jesus isn't just a, a personal, one-time, momentary decision about what you might believe. A commitment to Christ is a commitment to continually growing in and through Him and His grace and His knowledge. It's a commitment to mature, and not just by ourselves, with other people, that we all might grow up as the body of Christ. Anybody that's read the New Testament at all, and any portion of it, recognizes the truth of what I'm sharing. Spiritual growth helps us find direction in a similar way that life experiences teach us truth in a way that no other can. You know, there's some things that we're, tried, that we're told, and, and, and we get, we understand, but until we live them, we really don't get I mean, conceptually, we understood, but until we live through them, it, it, there's something about experience itself that, that really shapes and molds us and, and drives it down deep. And once we have that, then when we go through something similar, it, we're, we're different because we've been here before. Even if the circumstances are a bit different, we, we, we've been through something similar. We've had these feelings. We've had this, these, these things before. And so our life experience teaches us, and we handle it, hopefully, a bit differently. I think spiritual growth works in the same way. As we grow in Christ, we, we, we experience something in us that, that is greater than what we're experiencing outside of us. And it doesn't have to be specific. We don't have to have spiritual wisdom given to us about specifically how do you endure going through a pandemic and economic downturns, and, and, and cultural shifts. It doesn't have to be that specific. Just kind of in general, as we gain spiritual wisdom, as we experience just spiritual growth, even as we just experience the idea of growing itself, there's something about that that produces a kind of shelter, a sanctuary in our own lives to the storm. doesn't keep the storm from happening. It just it, it guides and protects us and gives us a sense of stability and purpose as we move our way through it, even if we're not sure of when or where the destination will be. Spiritual growth means that often we can't think or feel our way into right acting, but we can act our way into right thinking and feeling. That's what I'm trying to say. 
It's, it, the idea is just by committing to growth, committing to growing, committing the, the, in an ongoing way, there's something about that rhythm to regular, consistent growth that moves us into a better way of thinking, a better way of feeling. And no matter how we try to think, you know, and feel our way into it, we can't get there until we act right, until we get into the right routines of spiritual growth. Not just wanting to be a believer, but a follower. Not just having beliefs, but, but wanting to intim- uh, 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 imitate Jesus. Being a student of the Scripture, right? Learning not only truths in the Scripture, but also learning to hear God's voice. By recognizing God's voice, by by studying the Scripture, we begin to hear God's voice better in our own hearts and lives and receive direction as as we give permission to the Holy Spirit every day to to use us to establish His kingdom on earth. we, We begin to sense a calling greater than ourselves and a direction that's bigger than whatever mess we find ourselves in. Spiritual growth. And so here's your takeaway. If you want your faith to work, you're going to have to give God more than just an hour or two a week. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. That's good, isn't it? I wrote that down this week and I thought, yeah. Thought about my boys. I thought, what's one thing, one thing I could tell them that would really help? I think that's what I'd tell them. If you want your faith to work, you're going to have to give God more than an hour. You're going to have to give God more than just when you go to youth group. You're going to have to give God more than just, if you want to, I, want to, I know you believe, but do you want this to make a difference? Spiritual growth is much more normal and much more substantive than hocus pocus or or magic it's it's why we talk about daily devotions as well as weekly worship it's why we talk about purposeful prayer prayer as well as generous giving and joy-filled serving and you know all the spiritual disciplines it it, yeah it, it puts it in kind of this routine and that's the point you know as we as these things become routine to us it it's it becomes almost as routine as well, looking up an address on your phone so you can find your way. It's just part of it. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you'll grow as you learn to know God better and better. Grow. GPS, grow. Pray. I spent a whole sermon last week talking about the idea, the, specifically the practice of prayer. That both centers and recenters us in our lives when we feel unstable and lost and turned about and tossed or tossed about rather. Uh, uh, the the power of prayer to ground us and and I use that with the kind of the idea of lightning and the the the, the power of God looking for the shortest distance to be released into. I hope that was a helpful image and an encouraging image for you. I urged you to, and this is where I get I, my love of words as a preacher. I urge you to persist in the placing of yourself in the presence of God through the practice of prayer. And I was so deliberate in using all those exact words. Persist in placing yourself in the presence of God through the practice of prayer. And I wanted to mention a few other things about prayer this week. Earlier in the sermon, I I mentioned the idea of asking for directions. Well, that's kind of what I'm thinking about prayer here. We ask for directions. Prayer conveys the immediate presence of God. I find that if I'm not persistently placing myself in the presence of God, by default, I'm in the driver's seat of my life. And it doesn't matter how much I believe in my head or what faith I have in my heart, I'm still in control unless I'm praying. Prayer somehow helps me constantly move out of the way and allow God to take over and lead. There's a tremendous sense of direction when I do that that I don't have if I don't. To use the GPS analogy, when we pray, it's almost like our map is reloading. I've been going places before where my my GPS, my uh, app on my phone will tell me a new route, a quicker route has been found. Oh, I'm excited about that. It'll tell me if there's an accident on the way. Even recently, it's let me know that there's a speed trap ahead, and I am grateful. 
prayer functions like this. God will speak to us if we'll listen. We'll feel differently. There'll be thoughts that'll come to us that won't come otherwise. Prayer gives us updates to the direction of our lives. And I also wanted to mention this because I didn't have time last week. Prayer means that we're holding open the door of the God possible in places of despair. And I felt like that was really important. I wanted to mention it this week because, see, there's a lot of folks that are struggling right now way beyond just in being inconvenienced. I mean, there's people in this church that are facing life and death situations. There's people you know, maybe you are, facing some really difficult things. And some of it may be related to COVID-19, and some of it may have nothing to do at all with it. But part of what we do with prayer is that we, we hold open. When we talk about finding direction, sometimes, sometimes the, the hope that we need isn't the exact next step. We just want to know there, are, there is a next step. When we pray for people, when we open ourselves up to God in prayer, we're opening our our lives and the situations and the people for whom we're praying, we're opening that up to the God possible. And how incredibly important is that when that place in mind is a place of desperation? Spoke to my neighbor, I'll say this quickly, I'm running out of time. Spoke my, to my neighbor yesterday. Uh, thank you for praying for him. This is the uh, Pentecostal pastor retired. He's diagnosed COVID nineteen, been in and out of the hospital for weeks now, and uh, I, I won't go into the details. But you know, he's back in the hospital. I spoke with his wife yesterday, and I asked her, "Say how are you doing?" And she goes, "I'm I'm not doing very well." And I was so thankful for her honesty. What a pleasure it is to pray for her, to join her. As she shared about a place of despair in her own life. I'll join her in open the, opening the door of the God possible. Lastly, grow, pray, serve. The last part of that personal GPS we need to find direction, especially when directionless times, is the idea that we're, we're called to serve. It's about serving other people. There's an awful lot of American Christian, uh, uh, Christianity, Christian community that just misses this whole part of the faith. It's, it's deeply troubling. It's almost as if the idea of spiritual gifts aren't in the Bible. Or the concept of being the body of Christ, where each part serves and does its own thing. And that we work together to build up and seek the maturity of us all. It's almost like that doesn't exist. And yet, if we're ever going to find direction for our life, interestingly enough, ironically, and it makes complete sense if you know the God of Jesus Christ, this makes complete sense. The only way we'll ever find our unique purpose, our calling, is not by focusing on us, but focusing on others. Sounds just like the God of Jesus. And so I want to say two things very quickly about this. We'll spend more time about it in August. I want to talk about in August signs of hope. So we'll spend more time talking about serving others and finding our calling next month. But I'll say a few things, just a couple things real quickly. The first thing is we're never closer to Christ than when we're serving others in his name. Jesus came as a servant. He said he came to serve and, and, and to be and ultimately give his life. If his spirit's in us, we're servants too. The disciples saw themselves as servants. One of the things I, I've done is encourage you to to move away from using the word volunteer and use the word servant, not because there's anything wrong with the word volunteer, it's a great word, but, but the biblical word is servant, and, and the idea is not being a word police, but rather the idea of the scripture of identity change. See, I don't necessarily have to switch identities to be a volunteer, I can still go about my life, but to call myself a servant means I see myself differently. I serve someone, I'm serving, I'm a servant. A non-serving Christian is a contradiction of terms. And so it, it may not be official. Maybe you don't have a specific job yet in the church or outside of the church. Okay, well, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about seeing yourself as a servant, serving others. Part of how we find direction is by focusing on being his servant, serving God's purposes, serving others in need, wherever it is, whatever the need, whoever the needy. Last thing I'll say is this. Calling is born at the intersection of our gifts and abilities and the needs of others. Sometimes people struggle with that. So I don't know if I've ever been called to anything. Well, calling, again, it's not magic. It's just simply this. When what you can do, your gifts and abilities, who you are, and when that intersects, when that runs into the needs of others, that's called calling. That's when calling is born. 
Oftentimes people miss it because they, they underestimate. They say, well, anybody could do that. And that's a sign that that's what you're supposed to do. And that's where you have to have good Christian friends. Because good Christian, Christian friends will come around you and be like, and, and they'll be honest with you. They'll be like, no. And you probably won't listen to them, but you need to. Because they'll tell you, no, not everybody can do this. No, the way you're doing it, or, or this particular thing, whatever it is, or how you're doing it, it's unique. This, you're doing it in a way it seems easy to you because you're called to it. We're not all called to that. You need to do this. It's part of how you're being a servant of Jesus Christ. And it's fun. It's fun to make a difference in the life of someone else, especially when it doesn't seem to be like a big deal to you. That's a clue. This is God using you. And in the midst of just everything else being chaotic and just tossed about, wow, what sense of purpose and direction you can find when you see yourself as a servant and in the midst of chaos, nonetheless, God is using you to help others. Your own life, personal GPS. Grow, pray, study. Make each day count. Suffering can break us or it can break us open. And there's something to be said about a peace that we can have when we know where we are, even when we don't, and a confidence that somehow, despite how long it's taking, we know we're eventually going to get there. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As uh, Taylor comes back up and we uh, sing a great hymn of the church or listen to us sing, maybe listen to the song and maybe uh, sing under our breath, uh, here I am, Lord, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer very quickly. Lord, help us to receive this message and more importantly, live it out for our own sakes and the sake of those in our lives. Lord, we give you the glory. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.